Well, thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you very much for joining us for this last session. And this is the last class in the series about introduction to clinical and population studies. Um, now at the beginning of this series, I said that, you know, the fundamental problem that we try to solve in epidemiology, or in fact, in most of the social sciences very broadly, is what is the relationship between entity A and entity B? Basically, is there a relationship between two entities, two concepts, two phenomena? And if there is a relationship, what is the nature of that relationship? A lot of times when we're trying to characterize that relationship, what we're talking about, what we're, the question we're asking is, what is the magnitude of the relationship? Sometimes it is, what is the directionality of the relationship? If entity A um, increases, does entity B decrease? Or is it vice versa? Or do they move in the same direction? One other characteristic that we think about is the concept of causality. Is the relationship between entity A and entity B causal in nature or not? And many people would argue that that in fact is the most important characteristic of relationships that we try to understand, not just in epidemiology, um, but also in most of the social sciences. And we'll see why that is the case. So, you know, I'm just gonna tell you one um, folk tale. I, I bet you must, you must have heard some variation of it before at some point. You know, it's about these folks, these marauders who want to raid a village in Wakanda. And when they raided this village, they, they took away all the jewelries and all the goodies in this village. But these are very dangerous people. And when the people in Wakanda woke up, I mean, when the people in Wakanda realized that all their jewelries have been stolen, they wanted to go after these guys. But they knew they could not go during the day. So they went, they had to go under the cover of the night. Otherwise, these guys, you know, are very dangerous. But they could go under the cover of the night and get by their get back their stuff and go back to their village. And they said, out, oh, you know, they, when they got to where these guys were located, then they figured out that it would not be an easy task. There's just a lot of things to move and get back. And they, you know, they were getting tired. And the dilemma right now is that, well, we have just a few hours before daybreak. And how do we get all our stuff before daybreak? And the leader of their team summoned these wise men and asked them, well, what can we do? I mean, is there a way we, we could just, if we can just extend the night for a few more hours, we can rest a little bit and get all our stuff. And you know, the wise man thought a little bit and said, you know what? I think one way we can kind of reduce, uh, one way we can kind of elongate the night is why don't we get all the cocks in the, in the village and just kill them off? Because, you know, the cock crows and it crows daylight, it crows the daylight on. So you see, every time the cock crows, the daylight comes on. Maybe we should just get out all the cocks and then the day and the night extends. And that way we'll be able to get all our stuff. We can rest a little bit. And after a couple of hours, we go back to pack the rest of the stuff. Well, they rather continued getting back their juries. They went around finding all the cocks and they succeeded in killing all the cocks and they went to sleep for a couple of hours. By the time they woke up, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, they were expecting that it would still be, um, you know, a few hours before daybreak or some time before daybreak and they can continue their expedition. Um, but that did happen. You know, the reason why I've talked, you know, the reason why I've, 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 you know, I've recounted this folk tale, what does that have to do with causality? So I'm going to let somebody, anybody to weigh in. Why do you think I'm telling this story? What is the issue here in this whole story that has something to do with causality? Is there someone who's going to tell us from that end? Okay, I'm going to leave that question suspended, but I'm going to continue with my conversation. Was there someone who wants to tell us what that story has to do with causality? I will, um, I would let you speak to us. But here's the thing. Oh, okay, I think I see Tony Lopez wants to tell us what that story has to do with causality. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think in that story, the thoughts that the cock 
crowing would cause uh, daybreak. So they made a mistake and that was the problem. So Tolo is actually very right. You see, the wise man was very wise. I mean, he had done his science very well. He, he observed very carefully that anytime, he's lived so many years, so many days, and I've seen that anytime the cock crows, indeed, the day breaks. Just a few minutes later, there is a relationship. In fact, there's a very strong relationship because it, up, it happens almost every time, almost every day. But what is not done well is to characterize, you know, one of the characteristics of this relationship that is not gotten right is whether that relationship is causal or not. And because it is not causal, because he had made an assumption of causality where what actually just exists today is an association. See what it has costed them. And believe me or not, as stupid as this story sounds, so many times, in so many articles you read in the literature, you would see this kind of thinking that when something comes before the other, and when it comes consistently, when two things happen consistently with proximity, then they must be causing one another. Then one must be causing the other. But we can tell from this very simple story that that, in fact, is not the case. And the, the consequences of making such a wrong, wrong assumption can be very dire in clinical and population health situations. That's why, whether in policy situations or in clinical situations, we have to have a way of thinking, of thinking very rigorously and not casually about whether the relationship we're observing is causal or not. So when we say something is causal, what exactly do we mean? You see, this is one of those things that everybody intuitively understands what we talk about, but it's so very, it's tricky, very difficult to come up with a foolproof definition. You know, for most people, some of the most widely accepted definitions is that A is said to cause B. If A precedes B, and without A, B would not have happened. You would observe that there are two parts to that definition. A precedes B. But without A, if A had not happened, B would not have happened. You see, the wise man in that story observed the first part of that definition, A preceded B, with remarkable regularity. But the second part of the story is what he did not care to examine before reaching the conclusion that the crowing of the cup actually leads to breaking of the day. And therefore, he prescribed a policy recommendation, let us go kill all the cops and go to sleep, that resulted in a disaster. And there are so many policies out there today that are of the same nature, that are premised on the assumption of causality between two phenomena, where in fact, what we have observed, what the data is able to show is that there's, a, there's an association, but not necessarily demonstrating a causal relationship. And when we talk about the causal relationship, we've said that there are two components to it. A preceding B, and two, in the absence of A, B should not, should not happen. So if you're able to take A away, B would not happen. If you're able to institute, if you want B to happen, you need to be able to institute A. But here's the thing. The wise man in that story, can somebody, so the wise man in that story, you know, I said that it's done his observations very well. Why do we think that he still went ahead and make a wrong decision. Why did he reach that wrong decision? It is that the design, the design of the kind of studies, of the kind of observations, of the circumstances under which he made his observations are not optimal for one to test the second part of causality, which is whether when you remove A, would B fail to occur. That is why the ideal way to test causality is to actually institute a situation in which you are removing A. Don't just observe whether when there is A, B occurs, but also observe a situation where when there is when A changes, do we see a corresponding change in B also? And that exactly is the definition of the trial. That exactly is what we try to do in a clinical trial. What we do in a clinical trial is that 
we get a situation where we are sure that A is occurring, we create A. And at the same time, the situation where we are creating B and we are looking, we are observing whether B still occurs, I mean, occurs under the same circumstances in both situations. If it does not, then it gives us the latitude to come to, to, I mean, to, come to the conclusion that A does not only precede B, but when A does not occur, B fails to occur in this normal fashion. Or when A is instituted, or instituted a change in A, this to a corresponding change in B. Therefore, now we do not have enough data or data that is obtained under circumstances that allows us to test the second plank of the definition of causality. We have to be wary of making the assumption or reaching the conclusion that the nature of relationship that we see, just like virtue of being of precedence and regularity of such precedence actually represents causality. And you see, um, when it comes to the issue of causality, there have been people, you know, we took all semester long courses on causality alone at HSPH. There are people who have taken series of courses. There are in fact people who've written whole thesis and dissertations on topics in causality. And there are people who are spending their whole lifetime just elucidating and writing papers and thinking about causality. Therefore, what I want you to understand is that the conversation we're gonna to have today is not going to teach you how to think rigorously or become an expert in causality. But the objective of our conversation today is to help you to bring a bit more skepticism to the causal claims that you would encounter in a lot of the papers, a lot of the publications, whether in the clinical field or in the public health field, or even in social sciences much more broadly, where causal claims would be made. And you can ask the basic fundamental, the primary question that besides the presence of a relationship, precedence and regularity of that relationship is there, is there a design whether in terms of study design or in, sort of, in terms of analytical design that warrants the claim to causality that is, um, be, that's been encountered or that has been made by these authors. So, we have a question. Do you want a question? Go ahead, please. Luther, do you have a question? I guess we should keep going. Okay. So now when I say that, you know, say we have a trial, is there someone who's going to talk? So, you know, we have said that the wise man in that, in that fable, even though he's a very wise man, he understands that you don't make conclusions if you don't make observations. He observed before he made a conclusion, yet, he reached, a wrong, he reached a conclusion that led to a wrong policy prescription. Is there someone, now we've said that a trial is important. Is there someone who's going to, in, a, in, in less than a minute, you know, in 30 seconds, tell us, what should he have done? Say this out there, what should he have done to be able to reach the kind of conclusion that, we should, that, that would have warranted the policy prescription that he made? So I'm going to continue this conversation but when we have someone who wants to talk to us briefly about that. I mean, please, we should let it, we should let the person tell us what, how would you, what would you have loved to see? What, what should the wise man, what kind of design, what should they have designed to be able to warrant the kind of claim and policy prescription that they made? But the other thing I want to tell you is that I just talked about a trial, but for all intents and purposes, the ideal trial that I just told you about that would warrant us to know that, yes, the crowing of the cock is what causes daylight. That trial, it's an ideal. And I'll tell you, we'll go into the reasons why it ends up being an ideal. Nobody ends up conducting that trial. And don't, don't I mean, try to understand what I'm saying. We conduct experiments, yes. But a lot of times, even those experiments fall short 
of the ideal trial that we wanted to, that we were talking about. But a lot of times we're not able, we're able to conduct the, an experiment for several reasons. Therefore, when we make causal claims, we have to be wary about the kind of causal claims. In epidemiology and in social sciences broadly, the kind of causal claims, because you see, when it comes to mundane, mundane everyday issues, sometimes there are things that over centuries we've been able to determine the nature of relationships in those things. For instance, we know for a fact, 100%, that hogs do not crowd daylight into life. No. We know that for a fact, 100%. But for the kind of complex issues that we confront in epidemiology and population health, we are only able to make causal claims in a probabilistic and multifactorial framework. And what does all that grammar mean? Is that the best we're able to do a lot of times is to say that, well, we are 70% confident that the relationship between the crowing of the cock and that and daylight emerging is indeed a cause of war. Hardly ever will anybody be able to say, now nah, I've now demonstrated conclusively that 100%, you know, obesity in, is being caused by the intake of fast food in Nigeria. When you hear those kind of claims, you have to be wary, basically because the ideal trial to determine to, to have 100% certainty of that nature is just almost always impossible to conduct in the context of the kind of complex issues that we confront in clinical and population health. So one, I've explained what we've been there. So I've just, that's what we mean by probabilistic causality. But also multi-causal. Multi in the sense that the kind of issues that we deal with in clinical medicine and epidemiology, and even in most of social sciences, are such that the model of one cause and one effect hardly ever exists. There are usually multiple causes that are interacting in multiple different complex ways to lead to an outcome. Therefore, that target trial will still remain an ideal because that ideal is actually designed in the context of a unicausal philosophy. So I don't want to bore you with a lot of philosophy this morning. That's not the essence of this course. The essence of this conversation is to know that, so, because of all these complexities, when I see a paper in the Pan-African Medical Journal, or I see a paper in, from the New England Journal of Medicine, how do I think about the causal claims that have been made, that the authors are making in this paper? And so um, I, just, I just want to try out um, these broad um, concepts about causality before we narrow down in the summary specific concept that we want to talk, out, talk about today. Is anybody who has a comment or anybody wants to talk to, talk to us about that ideal trial for that, um, for, the, for, the, for, for the wise man? Okay, so we'll keep going. Um, so, because a lot of us thought, because the issues, the kind of issues we deal with in social sciences broadly, in clinical medicine, in, in, in population health, because of the, of the, of the complex nature of, of the questions that we're, 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 we're confronting, and because of the, the fact that we can only make causality in a probabilistic and multifactorial framework, we have to be very careful ourselves about making causal claims. And that's why only the most, only, only, I mean, very careful researchers are very, 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 you know, are very, very, very reluctant to use strong words like, now we have demonstrated that A causes B, or B is the effect of A. 
a lot of times we hear on the side of saying, well, A is associated with B, B is associated with A. Well, you know, the question that arises a lot when you talk to people about this kind of issue is, well, then if you will never know where whether A causes B or B causes A, then we would not be able to ever prescribe policy. No, that's not what we were saying. You know, the art of policy itself or the art of de developing an intervention whether clinical or in population health is an art. We just need to understand what is the strength of the causal inference. How sure are we? We will never be 100% sure, but we don't need to be 100% sure before we can develop an appropriate and balanced intervention. You know, we will not be able to conduct this perfect trial for whether lung cancer, I mean, for the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. But we're so sure that smoking causes lung cancer that we are almost approaching that 100% certainty. And we don't even need to get to that level before we say, well, it costs a lot. You know, before we say, well, maybe we should start telling people to stop smoking. We don't need to get to 100%. Because if we tell people to start to stop, take, I mean, stop smoking, um, the, the likelihood that we are airing, you know, in that kind of situation, number one, it's, it, it makes the, 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 the reasonable thing to do about policy is to err on the side of caution. But even besides that, the balance of the evidence really weighs towards the likelihood that causality, that the relationship between smoking and lung cancer is causal. Therefore, we can make policy to inhibit, to stop, to limit smoking on the basis of such evidence. The point I'm making is that we don't need, is that we have to be careful about making causal claims, but, all, but even while being careful in making causal claims, we can still go ahead and develop interventions, whether at the clinical level or policy level, that reflect the extent, that reflects the balance of the evidence and the extent of the confidence we have in, in, in the causal claim between interventions and outcomes. So we spoke about, um, you know, Yeah, I just said that the ideal starting point for making a causal claim is to develop an ideal trial. But tri trial is ideal. And it can be it's ideal for so many reasons. So many conditions that might be difficult for us to meet in terms of design. And even when we're able to meet those conditions in design, sometimes we're not able to meet those conditions in implementation and in analysis. And when you think about the key elements of a trial that we, would think that we would need, you would see some of the reasons why it is difficult to achieve that ideal trial. For instance, look at the wise man who was being asked that question um, in the middle of the night by the leader of their party. So what do you think, you know, say this wise man understands that, well, you know, association is not causation. The fact that the growing, I've seen hawks grow throughout my life and see the daybreak after that does not mean that it is causal. We need to be able to do a trial before we can, we can make a policy prescription that relies on its causality. What do you think would be the problem with that wise man in that situation? What problems would he have? Can we have someone tell us what kind of, you know, what kind of problems, do you think he would be able to, you know, to still get the kind of evidence that he needs to demonstrate causality in that situation? There's nobody who's, who wants to talk to us about that. Well, it's definitely not going to be able to find the evidence. And one, this, the, the, the most, the clearest limitation in that situation, it's time. These folks need to go out there before daybreak and get all the jewelry they want to get or go to sleep right now. They don't have the luxury of saying, okay, you know what we need to do right now is we need a trial actually. You know, imagine the wise man telling them, we actually need a trial right now. So why don't we do this? Um, let's look at 12 villages around here, randomly allocate some to cock crowing, some to no cock crowing. And then let's send all the soldiers to just go to those six villages, kill all the cocks, and wait and see whether, I mean, whether 
you know, there will be a difference between, and let's get some other people to be watching the time when the day breaks in all of um, communities and see whether there's a difference when day breaks. And then when we see that difference, when we see a difference, then we'll go back and decide whether it just doesn't have the luxury of that time. So a lot of time, we don't even have the time to conduct a trial. Um, so we have a question. Um, someone wants to know what a sham arm is. Um, so in, in the line in where it says comparator, um, it says, if we already know that a drug works, for instance, would it be ethical to assign anyone to the placebo arm or the sham arm? And the second question is, what is a surrogate outcome? Surrogate outcome, sham arm. So here, let me just, I mean, take you through this slide. Um, so some of, the, some of the problems that we have, so just look at the design that I've just spoke about right now. For you to know whether there is causality, what this white man should have done is do this. Say that, okay, let's find 12 villages. Let's randomly assign um, six of them to Cochrane, six of them to no Cochrane. The six of them with no Cochrane, let's go kill all the cops there. And let's get some people who can measure, I mean, who can watch out for daybreak very well and let them write down the exact time when the day breaks. And we'll see if there's a difference in the places where cops were dead and places where cops were alive and they crowed appropriately. Um, the problem with that, though, is the first thing we talked about. There's just no time for all that in this context. And that is the situation that an epidemiologist faces a lot of time. Sometimes some diseases take years and years and years in terms of latency. You know, um, if somebody smokes, it is not the smoke, the, 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 it is not the cigarette you smoke today that results in, in, in lung cancer. There's a long follow up. And sometimes you just don't have the luxury of that time. The other thing here is that, you see, the white man would have needed to be able to find six villages where villagers would agree that they should kill out, kill out all their six cocks and all their cocks in their villages because of this experiment. And who is that villager that would agree that, well, well you can kick my, kill my own cock, but let the cock in other places stay? And that is the thing. Sometimes you would find it difficult to find participants who would agree to be on the, you know, on the side or in the end that's regarded as being unfavorable in your trial. And therefore it makes the design of the trial very complicated. And sometimes we ask, the, sometimes the question is, and you know, sometimes, um, you know, let's leave the cock analogy for, for instance, let's say what we're trying to figure out is whether paracetamol works for headache. And what we're trying to do is to say, okay, let's try, let's not say just because um, when people take paracetamol, sometimes they feel, I mean, they feel okay. Therefore, because being okay follows the taking of paracetamol, paracetamol cures headache. Let's not do that. We've just shown previously that that kind of thinking might be, might open us to the risk of making casual claims. Okay, let's do this experiment where we get some people who have headache, maybe 20 of them, Randomize 10 of them to take a prostamol and tell the other 10 don't take first. I mean, tell the other 10 don't take prostamol, or for the other 10, just get some pieces of chalk, make it into the shape of a prostamol and just give it to them. That is what we would call a placebo. A placebo is something that we're giving where the, the recipients do not know and where, the reci where it looks exactly like the, an intervention. But in fact, the active ingredient in intervention does not exist in what you are allocating to these um, trial participants. So, because you need to do that so that you will find people to compare to the people who actually took um, the paracetamol. And that is what we mean by a sham, you know, a sham intervention. All they are taking is chalk, there's no paracetamol in it. Or what we might as well call a placebo intervention. So we say, okay, you take it. I mean, we allocate some people to the prostamol, some people to the sham, and then they take it. And after one hour, we check with each of them, and we still have an headache. So we want to compare whether the people who took the prostamol um, would show more relief than the people who we gave just the pieces of chalk that had the same shape as the prostamol tablet. Um, now, 
You see, the only question is that sometimes we can even find, you can find some of your patients who would say, well, doctor, you know, I don't mind. I don't mind. I'm going to participate if you want. If you, I mean, or some of your patients who they are, they are, they are ready to say, we just participate. Whatever the doctor wants, just participate. But we should ask ourselves, would it be a right thing to say, well, to conduct a study, let's go, let's get 100 teenagers. Let's randomize 50 of them to smoking and 50 of them to no smoking. And then you tend to tell these teenagers, you know, we want you guys to start smoking. Number one, would you even find parents who would allow their teenagers to join your study? But even if you do, does it, is it fair? Is it ethical for you to ask some 50 teenagers to start smoking? Just so you want to see whether they would develop lung cancer in the future. Or whether you want to see whether they would develop um, um, bladder cancer in the future. Especially now that we already know that even if smoking does not cause bladder cancer, it does in fact cause lung cancer. So we know that smoking is bad for the fact. But we, we are interested in the we are interested in the valid clinical question does smoking also cause bladder cancer? So if we're interested in that question, can we ethically conduct that kind of trial? Especially in the context where you already know that leave bladder cancer aside, smoking has negative effects. It causes lung cancer. So even if some people, even if there are, are kids, there are teenagers that would agree to participate in that study, is that and ethically, would you as a physician, as a scientist, as a policymaker, subject teenagers to that kind of treatment? So those are a lot of the conundrums that we deal with in terms of the design of, it, of that target, that ideal trial that makes it remain an ideal far too often. You know, and you know, this is just a snapshot. There are tons and tons and tons and tons of reasons why, even if we are able to fix all these problems, when it comes to implementation, errors occur, mistakes occur, and the trial ends up not being the ideal that we wanted it to be. But like I told you earlier, even in the absence of the ideal, even when you have an experiment, we have a trial, it does not mean that we cannot draw inferences or we cannot create, we cannot, um, we cannot create interventions based on inferences drawn from it. It is just that we need to understand that there are divisions from the ideal, and therefore bear those divisions in mind when we're drawing our inferences and when we're designing policies based on those kind of inferences. Is there anybody who has a question, or is there anything that that's still on, that's unclear so far? So, you know. Some of the complications that I described in the previous slide have to do with even when we're able to design an experiment, which is even closer to the target trial we're talking about. But sometimes an experiment, even an experiment that is flawed even in implementation, is still not possible. Okay, say we're inter somebody is interested in whether childhood obesity causes um, type 2 diabetes mellitus, or whether childhood obesity actually increases the risk of microvascular complications in type 2 diabetes. So, you know, ideally what you know, I want to do in that kind of situation is randomize kids to obesity when they were in childhood. Say you want to run by six year olds to obesity. You want to follow them. Usually before, when, I mean, before type two DM emerges, maybe people will be in their fifties or sixties, or maybe in their forties. And then before you have complications, microvascular complications, you take some other ten years. So who is that scientist who wants to conduct a sixty year trial? And how much of resources would go into that kind of study? So sometimes you don't. I mean. You're not doing that. And that is why some very smart epidemiologists have come up with different kinds of mo variations, modifications, 
inventions? Well, well if we're in, I mean, based on the kind, all the kind of questions, all kind of problems that we confront, participants, you know, the, the ethical issues, the time, the money. Well, there are other things that we can do to approximate that trial that would save us from some of these conundrums. For instance, in terms of time, okay, maybe a case control. When you look at the case control, essentially what it's trying to do is to simulate a cohort study. When you look at the cohort study, a cohort study essentially is trying to simulate the randomized trial. Where the non trial is not, where experimentation is not possible? Of course. In trying to solve some of the problems, we make some compromises that have implications for the kind of inferences we can make. But as long as we design the cohort study, as long as we are able to envision the ideal trial that we should have in this study, and we design with I mean, the job of the epidemiologist ultimately is to come up with a study design that recognizes the ideal trial, but also recognizes all the limitations that make it impossible. And then we're able to design something that circumvents those implications, but understands what are the compromises that is being made in the course of circumventing those limitations. And that exactly is what led to things like core trials, to core studies, case control studies, and all the other more complex designs that we have out there. That one way or the other brings some advantage in terms of being more feasible than the ideal trial while making some compromises, but having a way to judge the nature of the compromises that are being made and therefore be able to reach reasonable causal inferences. So now we start from the from the we, we know we've we've come all the way from understanding the importance of accurate causal inferences and understanding that the resource we need to be able to make that accurate causal inference confidently is often in the context of a cardiac trial that is not available and therefore we settle for other designs that are kind of compromises, but also help us to circumvent the problems of physics that, that make the tender trial not feasible. But now when we have those compromise studies, a lot of times which are observational studies, how do we how do we judge the confidence that we can have in the causal inference that we draw from those studies? And that has been the domain of a lot of debate among philosophers, social scientists, epidemiologists and clinicians for several decades. I'm not gonna be, I mean, like I said earlier, this is not, I mean, we're not gonna be talking about all that history here. We're just, we're going to talk about Bradford Eel because Bradford Eel um, was an epidemiologist and social scientist that articulated a set of criteria that people should bear in mind in judging whether the relationship that they observe between two phenomena is, cash, is actually causal in nature or not. And those criteria were widely accepted for a very long, long time, which is the reason why it's important for us to just articulate um, those criteria here. But over time, um, epidemiology has Pro, I mean, has progressed and people have shown that, you know, maybe temporality is the only one amongst all these eight criteria, or all these nine criteria that can be regarded as being sacrosanct. You know, these other criteria, yes, they can help us to think about whether our claims, whether our, the, whether the relationship we observe in our data are causal in nature, but we must understand that they are, they are not foolproof in us of themselves. There can be situations, you see, the, you know, the stronger the relationship, you know, if the odds ratio or the relative risk is like five, we should have some more confidence in our, in our, in, in this, in this relationship. 
than if it were 1.2. Yes. But we should be careful because that it is not foolproof. The strength is not foolproof. There are situations where you can find strong relationships that are in fact not causal. I won't go into the story. I, I, you know, I, I don't um this, I just want us to bear this criteria in mind and know that you're not foolproof. Temporality is the only one when you look at the definition I gave you earlier. For something to be a cause, it must precede the effect. Yes. I mean, that's the only one that appears to be, I mean, foolproof, but I but you know, I wanted to bear all these other ones in mind because the more you know, the more you are seeing all these criteria converging, the more you can have increasing confidence that maybe the relationship you are seeing is causal, but still also know that it's not foolproof. But you know, even temporality, people have argued that sometimes the, part, the marker that you are using can really mess things up about temporality. So take cancer, for instance. There are certain exposures, certain exposure sizing chemicals that people have been so interested, say things like aniline, and people have been interested whether exposure to such chemicals would cause bladder cancer. But it turns out, it turns out that the biomarker that people have been using to assess some of these chemicals is a biomarker that doesn't show up until way, 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 way down the line after you've been having a lot of exposure. So, and that, I mean, so when you look at, when you look at um, bladder cells and you see that, well, we see this biomarker in bladder cells a lot of time, but it turns out that we never see these biomarkers in precancerous cells. So people are like, well, um, even though, um, I mean, some of these acrylic, I mean, acrylic chemicals show up in, in cancer cells, maybe they're not causal because they don't actually precede the cancer. You never find them in precancerous cancer cells. You find them only in cancer cells. But now that there are better biomarkers, there are biomarkers that, you know, we know that are still consequences of, of, of exposure to these chemicals but only appear earlier, you see that these biomarkers appear almost always before cancer cells appear. So the essence of all this story is that of all the things that Bradford Hill has brought to us, we are grateful, they are helpful in terms of, you see, when you see all nine of them lining up in a particular situation, it's very likely that you are thinking about, you are, you are dealing with a causal condition. But let none of them, in as of itself, should be taken as a full demonstration that causality has been established. So in essence, causality, in the context of the complex problems that we deal with in clinical medicine, in population health, in social sciences, causality is only achieved in a probabilistic and multifactorial model. Now, poll time. So I've been, talk, I've been talking and talking alone and telling a lot of stories in the last um, 40 or 50 minutes. So it's time for you to talk now. Well, is it time to? Yeah, I'm in the poll now so that we can. 
and then show and result. Okay. By using the well, so now I, I know I've not been speaking in vain, kind of. Um, so most people here, some five percent of respondents have said that B is the answer by using blood pressure measured before the onset. And nobody, thankfully, nobody chose C. I mean, that's that that's that's reassuring. Um, can we find someone who wants to tell us why? Um, B is the answer. B is actually the answer. But can we find someone um, who wants to tell us why B is the answer? Okay, can I um, cold call? I mean, I don't. I think that's fine. Definitely, um, a lot of people chose B. So I, I think. Okay. To the lock back. I think for uh, why the answer is B is because um, this study that we have here compares the um, the risk factor, which is the blood pressure, and the outcome, which is the heart failure, um, at the same time. So it's a cross-sectional study, and um, because cross-sectional studies cannot, um, it's impossible to check for causality with cross-sectional studies. So that's why that's um, the study was was a bad study, but to improve it, you have to use um, previous um, blood pressure. So that would be like um, you are maybe following this patient into the past, looking the patient data into in, like <coughs> you are looking at their previous record. Then you are following them from the past into the future. So doing like a um, that would be a, a case control study. Yes, a case control study. Okay. I mean that's I mean that's that's a beautiful explanation. But I want someone else again. So let's believe the person that, that I've had speak today. I want someone else again to speak to why B might be answer. And I'll, I'll just speak to this question. Whether you want to tell us why C was the wrong answer or why B was the right answer or why D was a, would be a wrong answer. I mean, but I, I want someone else um to speak to to speak to this question. If there are no volunteers, we, I mean, we would, could call. Okay, that's, can we okay? Please unmute yourself. Um, hello, hello. Hi. Um, I think I just want to talk about why um, C is the wrong answer. Okay. You can't um, give people medication to increase their blood pressure and then follow them up. That's unethical, like what you explained earlier on. And I think B is the right answer because it's a case control study. We already know the outcome is heart failure. So we want to go back in the past to find out what was the exposure and then you know, follow them up like that. So I think it would be high blood pressure in the past, not present. That would be the cause of the heart failure that we're looking at. So those That's are, what I think. Thank you very much, Iwoke. I mean, I really appreciate it. And so those are very, very interesting um, um, explanations. And, and, and that, that, that's important. That's, that's, that, that, that's really important. Um, you see, we have one more comment. Go ahead, please. Yes, I I think why B is the answer is that uh, since we have agreed that the uh, the uh, the outcome will come uh, the the outcome will come after uh, the relationship between the outcome and the and the risk is that the outcome. Uh, must uh, must the, the the outcome must precede must precede the uh, no sorry the risk must precede the outcome to know if there is a cash, uh, causal relationship. What I mean is that we must have seen the result. Now in this case, we have seen that these people have these people have had failure. That means taking that blood pressure today we mean we means that we means that. We are using the, the, the outcome of 
uh, the outcome of their results of today to judge their past. It's not supposed to do. You are supposed to look at what they have in the past and look at what they have at the moment and see if there is a relationship between them. In this case, you have known that there is a heart failure, but what, what, what makes us to know that it's a heart failure is that you have taken their blood pressure in the past. So you are able to tell that because of their blood pressure they have taken in the past, is what leads to the heart failure that we are seeing today. Taking it, take, if, if you are taking their, their blood pressure today, it, that means we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are going back, which is not supposed to be. No, that, that's correct. Thank, so. thank you very much, Akim. So, so you know, you know, there's a lot of very interesting causal thinking going on here, and you know, now I know that I'm not, I'm, I'm, we're not just, you know, speaking into the air. Yes, from a causal perspective, a cause would precede the outcome. A is said to be a cause to B. Remember the two conceptual, I mean, construct, conceptual requirements. A needs to precede B if A is going to be a cause. And then in the absence of A, B would, should not exist. Or when A exists, I mean, instituting A should institute B. So one cardinal point is that when you design a study, when you make causal inference, always bear in mind that the, the exposure precede the outcome. Now, having said that, you know, there are times when it's difficult for us to go and find exposures in the past. And we know, and maybe sometimes people have shown that there are some things that when you measure today, we have evidence that what you measure today reflects what, what you had two year, I mean, a month ago, two months ago. So sometimes we use current measurement as a proxy for prior measurements. But the exposure of interest, when we are trying to make a causal claim, is actually an exposure that precedes the outcome that we are thinking about. Therefore, if we want to make a causal claim here, the best way to do that is to measure the exposure that had occurred in the past. That is when mechanistically, we can argue that the relationship we are seeing here would have been causal. So I think I'm gonna take a break, um, a five to 10 minute break at this point. Um, well, I think we just take a 10 minute break at this point. Um, when we're back, we're going to round up the conversation. Okay, so we, we can get back at what? 2.10. Okay, and that is 7.10 in yes. West African time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right.
can get started in one minute. Um, So the next slide um, is supposed to be like another poll, right? Next slide? Yeah, is it? No, 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 no. Okay. It's All right. Just the answer to the prior poll. Okay, but then after after that? After that, that's not, um, it's still not. It's not um, a poll. It's not a poll. Okay, all right, because it means that. Oh, wait, it is actually. Uh, okay, yeah. So that poll is wrongly placed. It's supposed to come after the next set of discussions. So after we talk about the component cost model. Okay, okay, okay. And we talk about time. Yeah, okay. okay. So, um, yeah, so what's going to happen is I'm just going to. Then we can come back to that after, yeah. Yeah. So okay. I'm just, I'm just going to go to slide 12. Okay. Yeah. So we can get started, yeah. Welcome back. Okay, so thank you. Um, so in the first half, welcome back everyone. In the first half, we talked about um, the importance of drawing accurate causal inference. And how do we think about the work and the thinking we need to do to be able to draw, to be able to evaluate whether a causal claim that we are being confronted with is actually believable and if believable to what extent and the constraints that practical studies might encounter to be able to get to that point. Now I'm going to go back to a little bit, I mean a little bit, a little more, I mean a few more concepts about causality. I said earlier that we think about for the kind of, excuse me, for the kind of complex issues that we deal with in epidemiology and, and, and clinical studies, we think about causality in a probabilistic and um, multi-causal model framework. I've explained what a probabilistic model would mean. What would a multi-causal framework model mean? So we we'll go back to, you know, to the model that was developed by a very, one of the leading modern epidemiologists, Kenneth Rothman. And in, in Rothman's model, in Rothman's model, it tells us about you know, it's a very complex, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an elaborate model, but I'm just talking about three concepts. You know, what is a cause to start with? It's somewhat definition of a cause, is an event, condition, or characteristic that plays an essential role in producing an occurrence of the disease. We might say an occurrence of an outcome, just because they, I mean, basically, when Kenneth wrote this, um, when, when, when Professor Rothman wrote this, um, decades back, epidemiology was firmly and firmly focused on diseases and outcomes. Diseases are still our main outcomes today, but now we have different branches of epidemiology that focus on different other kinds of outcomes that are not strictly diseases. Um, so, but essentially it causes something, whether a phenomenon, an event, a condition, a characteristic, it can be a whole range of things. But when we say we're making a causal claim, what do we mean? It means that we're saying that this event or phenomenon does not only precede the outcome that we're interested in, but has an essential role in actually producing that outcome. Um, so when we say there are multifactorial co I mean, causes, what we've come to realize is that the idea that there is one thing that causes one thing hardly ever exists in the technology context. What happens a lot of time is there's a combination of factors that interact together and produce a combination of outcomes also. So it is in that context, that is what a multifactorial model, I mean, it is in that context that Rothman brought this model to help us think a little bit, have a, I mean, have a way of thinking about this 
complexity that we're not in a unimodal, unicausal, and that most of the time in epidemiology, a unicausal framework would not make sense. So it says there are, there are, so there are things that we call sufficient causes, there are component causes, there are necessary causes. So say we know that there are multiple causes that result in an outcome. Of course, we say that, okay, um, HIV is what leads to AIDS. SARS-CoV-2 infection is what leads to COVID-19. Yeah, where COVID-19 is the constellation of signs and the I mean, signs and symptoms that we see in the disease. SARS-CoV-2 is an infectious agent. But here's the conundrum. There are so many people who've had SARS-CoV-2 inf infection. We, everyone here knows so many people who've had it, but never had all those symptoms that are and, 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 and signs that are associated with the disease. So yes, they had SARS-CoV-2, but did not have the COVID-19 disease. That tells us that while SARS-CoV-2 is one of the things that are required, that play an essential role in the occurrence of this disease, it is not all the story. And it is this kind of observations that made, I mean, Dr. Rothman came up with this um, model. So a component cost is one of those things. One of an event, a condition, a characteristic that, ha that needs to be there for you to see the outcome. You know, it's one of those things that comes together to be able to see the outcome. In fact, a component cost is agnostic to whether it, it, it is a necessity for it to be there. But when it is there, it actually contributes to the outcome. So say um, something like malnutrition, for instance. We know that people who are very malnourished, if they have SARS-CoV-2 and you are malnourished, or people who have um, some kind of immune compromise. If you have SARS-CoV-2, you have immune, I mean, immune compromise, you are very likely to come down with, the, with, the, with, the, with COVID-19 disease. So immune compromise, for instance, um, well, it is not everybody. So immunocompromise is something that plays a role, but sometimes people are not immunocompromised, but they still have the disease. Yes, so immunocompromise, being immunocompromised is the component cause. But SARS-CoV-2 infection, for instance, people would never come down with COVID-19 if they don't have a SARS-CoV-2 infection. If they come up with anything, you know, it is not COVID-19, it's something else. Or we've just not really detected that they have SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 infection is a requirement. It plays an essential role and it is required to be in the mix. So it is a necessary cause. SARS-CoV-2 will be a necessary cause, but immunocompromise is not, is not, a, necess it's not, necess I mean, it's not a necessary cause. It's a component cause. It's a necessary cause is a component cause to start with, but Besides being a component in the sense that it, it is there and it plays a part in the, in the outcome, it has to be there. It is a requirement. If it is not there, you would not find the outcome. That is what makes the necessary cost. Now, something can be a component cost. In fact, it can be a necessary cost. But when it is there, in as a, by itself, does not always produce the outcome. And that's something like SARS-CoV-2. You know, it is there, it has to be there. Therefore, it's the necessary cause. But there are times when it is there, it doesn't produce an outcome. But when you have a constellation, a set of conditions, it might be SARS-CoV-2, which is necessary cause, with a number of things, maybe with even a compromise, when they come together and they always produce, when they come together, they produce an outcome. That is what is called a sufficient cost. When you find a sufficient cost, it is a set of conditions, a set of events that when they come together, they are able to produce, consistently produce the outcome and all play a role. It is their interaction that brings out that outcome. So, so here is an example here. When you look at the boxes right here, SARS-CoV-2 infection, overwhelmed immune system, or nutritional status. That taken together are regarded as a sufficient cause because those are three conditions where whenever they all come together, they interact, they would produce severe COVID-19 as an effect, I mean, as a disease. There might be a different constellation 
that's also a minimum, a, a, that's also a sufficient cause. Like you see here, somebody who has SARS CoV 2, who has metastatic cancer, those are two causes when, when they interact, they always produce severe COVID 19 as an outcome, too, at least in the context of this conversation. Um, so, but each of them, when you look at both situations, when you look at both situations, the cause that is constant, that has to be present in any of the sufficient cause um, models is SARS CoV 2. You see it in the first box, you see it in the second box. That is how you know that this is a necessary cause. SARS CoV 2 is not just a, comp a component cause, but it's a necessary cause because in all the sufficient causes, that we can only subject causes that we can identify, that's cause of two has to be a component. That is how we know that it's a necessary cause. So I hope you know as we move on, we will have more opportunity to distinguish between what is, what is a component cause, when does it become a sufficient cause, and when do we say it is a so everyone when does it become a, a, a necessary cause, and when when does it when is it sufficient, when when does, when does it trans, when do we have um, enough information to say, well, looks like this is a sufficient cause, um, taking this constellation together. So the other concept that we need to bear in mind, and we've spoken a lot about- This might be a, sorry, this might be a good time to go back to that poll. Oh, okay. Okay, well, maybe you can bring it up. Yeah, so maybe if you scroll back on your, because it's helpful for people to see it on this, on this slide deck. I will also bring it up here in a moment. Okay. Um, poll 19, yes. Poll time. That was the wrong poll. This is the correct one. I wondered to. In answering the question, notice that the question asks for what, which of the causes, of, which is wrong in this case. Well, Amati, I'm sending you messages. Can you see it? Uh, it's on Zoom. Uh, that one will talk small. Actually, my Zoom. Okay, all right. I let me let me take the response to this one. Let me end Paul. Okay, and share results. Um, so so there is. Do you want do you want to take this one? It's poll 19. Yeah. Okay. Well, so mm, I see we're all over the place. Yeah. Wow. So so let me let me let me let me just respond to the question yeah, yeah. and then, That's and okay. then move on. Yeah. So so because the reason why I'm saying that is because the the answer that we've written in here is wrong. Uh, I'm reading through it, I see that it's wrong. So basically, 
the, this question asks many different asks about many different concepts so the first one is about temporal is about temporality and necessary cause that we just talked about the second one sorry the first one is about the necessary cause model that we, we're just talking about the second one is about temporality that's b then the third one is about confounding which we'll talk about in a few minutes and and then the fourth one is also about the concept of the ideal trial that dr Motai was talking about earlier you know and d is the correct is is the correct answer in this question okay because here the question asks which of the following statements is wrong here SARS-CoV-2 is a necessary cause of COVID-19, right? We, we talked about that. And then in B, um, if a person starts smoking marijuana after they're diagnosed with lung cancer, it could not have caused their cancer. This is the temporality thing that we were talking about. The marijuana in ingestion has to come before the onset of lung cancer for it to have a chance of being the cause. Then C is confounding. We'll talk about confounding in a moment. And then D, Dr. Motaro talked about, you know, how we, if the fact that you cannot conduct an experiment or a trial does not mean that that thing doesn't cause the disease, doesn't mean that we, we can't be sure, you know, like we, we can use everything else that we can use all the other tools that we have to try to get at the question. Okay. A trial is the ideal, but there are often times when we cannot conduct a trial, but we will use all the other tools that we have to try to get at the question. Okay. Sorry for for inter getting into the, the, the class. Wait, 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 that, that's, a, that's okay. That's that, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So I just I wanted to comment on on on, on question D. So um yeah, we can be sure. We can be sure. Um so what I don't want us to confuse is that when I say that we would never say we are we we are hundred percent confident that when I say that we, we we I mean we only have a probabilistic framework yes but you know that when people say we are when we use sure in regular language a lot of times um what it means is that we are confident yes um we might not have hundred percent um certainty about what causes what but we can have enough confidence to know that yes at this point we should intervene because um, we have high enough confidence to be sure that this is, I mean, there's a relationship that is caused out here. And even in the absence of a target trial, there's a lot of things we can do. That, ex that essentially is the work of, an, that's what an epidemiologist does. That's what an epidemiologist, that is the essence of learning epidemiology. To be able to think about what a target trial is, you know, hardly ever will be able to conduct that. But be able to think about what are the so many other things in the toolbox of an epidemiologist that I can bring to bear to be able to get up to a point where we can be sure of whether a causal relationship exists or does not, and therefore be able to formulate an intervention, whether a clinical one or a policy one, to that that is that addresses the problem in question. Okay, so we're going to move on a little bit faster. So here I was going to say that, and I think we've armored on this enough sufficiently, that time matters and matters a lot. You know, of all the Bradford Hill criteria, if there is anyone that is unassailable, it is temporality, it is the ideal. And in all definitions of cost, it is fundamentally agreed that a cost is something that comes before what we call its outcome. And that has a lot of implications, particularly in conditions where there is what we call where they are, where they are, they are time lag. Not just in, in so it has a lot of implications in all the studies that we, we think about. We must always think about what is the relationship in time. Look at the study, the question about blood pressure and heart failure. Because we know the mechanistic theory that we are trying to test. Meaning that the relationship we are trying to test in theory is whether blood pressure, in terms of mechanism, the blood pressure, high blood, I mean, high blood pressure occurs first before um, um, heart failure occurs. 
Therefore, if you want to measure something, we have to measure high blood pressure that precedes um, heart failure. Just like when we're thinking about COVID-19, COVID in our theory, we believe that COVID-19, um, from all the mechanistic studies, COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection must occur. So we have to measure a SARS-CoV-2 at a time point that precedes COVID-19 disease. Now, the issues get more complicated than that in some other studies. For instance, if we are if, if we are interested in studying whether smoking causes um, bladder cancer, when people smoke, all the changes, the micro changes that need to occur in the bladder from the smoke that goes into people's um, lungs before it gets to the bladder, all the micro changes that just needs to occur takes a minimum of a decade in most people to occur. So when you're thinking about your study, you have to bear in mind the role of time in the mechanism as you design your study. So if you are designing a core study, for instance, in that context, and you are measuring what people are smoking today, and you go and measure blood, bladder cancer in three, in three weeks' time, you would not find a relationship. And then, but in that kind of situation, you cannot go out and say there's no causal relationship between. No. You can only say there's no causal relationship between this, between smoking and blood, every blood cancer for someone who has smoked for just three weeks. Because in terms of the mechanistic theory, the relationship is meant to span about 10 years. So when you design your study, it's either like you're designing a study that goes 10 years, or even if you are doing a case control. When you want to obtain information from the cases about smoking, you are not asking them about smoking last year, last week. You are asking them about smoking up until 10 years ago. In infectious diseases, it is even more complicated because when you get an infection, when you're infected with a pathogen, the disease doesn't just blow up the following day. They are very periods. There are varying periods from when you get exposure to the pathogen itself till when the pathogen is able to take root in the in, in take root, you know, in your body. For instance, that's what we call the induction period. You need to account for that in your study design because the pathogen might not even be measurable, um, depending on the kind of biomarker you are looking at. For instance, if you are looking at pneumococcus, for instance, some of that, part, I mean, a lot of times, um, you know, you're looking at carriage. So the induction period is almost zero. But for some other biomarkers, it is not just, for instance, okay, we are looking at HIV, for instance. Um, a lot of the, of, the, of the initial screening tests are antibody markers. So when the, um, when, 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 when the, the, when the virus, you know, when the HIV virus um, gets into the body, it doesn't produce, the body doesn't produce the, um, um, the antibodies immediately. It takes time. It takes time. If you go in there and start trying to measure the exposure before and without giving that induction period, that you won't find the exposure. So you have to bear these time lags in mind when you are designing your study, right from where you are, how you measure your exposure, how you measure your outcome, and the timing, the time that you want to give between when the exposure is measured and when the outcome is measured. You have to think carefully about the mechanistic theory that you are testing, and that has to guide how you design your, your study in terms of measurement, but, I mean, in terms of the time interval where you measure and the time lag between your measurements. Can we can we skip this next poll so that we can get to get, have some time to talk about confounding? Okay, so yeah. um, here we go. Um, yes, 
you know, in the first half of this of this um conversation, we spoke a lot about concepts and concepts and concepts. What does a cost mean? What does it mean to have a cost? And what are the different ways in which we think about a cost? But I want to say that if you don't take anything away from this lecture, besides all the other things, ensure that you're going to take away from this lecture this last concept, and that is confounding. Essentially, I mean, when you look at any of the, any epidemiological study, a lot of times, a lot of what we do in epidemiology is trying to deal with confounding, asking the question. And essentially, what does confounding mean in general English? It means conflation. It means that, you know, for instance, if we say, is there a relationship between um, malnutrition and, and, and COVID-19? When we say that it's confounding, it means that when we say that the relationship between malnutrition and COVID-19 is confounded, what it means is that there is something else that has been conflicted with that relationship. You mix something else with that relationship. And until you, are, you can separate or tease apart that thing, the inference you are drawing, my, it's not reliable. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot rely on the causal inference you are drawing from the relationship you are seeing. The figures you are seeing do not just belong to the exposure and outcome you are looking at. Something else has been mixed with it. And if you do not separate that thing, um, you cannot tell whether the relationship you are seeing is real or not. So, you know, in classical terms, what, what is a confounder? For something to be called a confounder, it has to fulfill three fundamental conditions. One, it has to be associated with the exposure. Two, it has to be associated with the outcome also. So because of its association with the exposure and its association with the outcome, it is likely that what you are seeing, the, the, the relationship you are seeing between the exposure and the outcome is actually the relationship between that third factor that we're calling the confounder. It is the one driving the relationship that you are observing. If you take back your mind, okay, no, let's, so if you, if you take back your mind to the, uh, to the, to the, to the conversation about um, smoking and bladder cancer, or, uh, okay, let's, let's look at the story of coffee and bladder cancer. You know, we know that smoking causes bladder cancer, yeah. Now, you look at a lot of data sets, you see that people who are drinking more coffee tend to be having more bladder cancer. And you're like, well, maybe coffee also causes bladder cancer. But over time, what we've been able to tease apart is that, you see, what happens is that the people who, who, the people who take coffee, people who take a lot of coffee, end up being more likely to, I mean, to be smokers. So smoking, is associated with coffee taking. But people who are smoking with or without any other thing are, like, are much more likely to have bladder cancer. So when you look amongst people who are taking coffee, you see that how oh, far more people among people who are taking coffee are having bladder cancer compared to the general population. And you think coffee is what's causing bladder cancer. The problem is, if you remove the people who are smoking among the people take, I mean, taking coffee, you don't, you know, that relationship doesn't exist. Basically, it is the smoking that is associated with coffee that makes it appear as if coffee is causing bladder cancer. No, it is just an artifact of the fact that people who are taking coffee mostly are mostly smokers also. So it is smoking that has a fundamental relationship, that has a causal relationship with bladder cancer, but it also confounds the relationship between coffee and bladder cancer and shows up in your data as if there's a relationship, shows up as an association, but in fact, there is no causal relationship. <coughs> that relationship is just an artifact of the population. It says that in the population studied, most of the coffee drinkers end up being smokers. Thus, because smoking is a common, has a common has a relationship with both the exposure, which is coffee drinking, 
and the outcome, which is which is bladder cancer, it shows up as a relationship between coffee and bladder cancer. Now, when you look at the table, um, when you look at when you look at the table up here. Can't see. Essentially, what you see here is a relationship between MI, that's myocardial infarction, and diabetes. What we see here is that there is an increased risk of diabetes. There is an increased um, risk of um, myocardial infarction amongst people who have diabetes. But the, the question here is that. Is this a causal relationship? Is it that diabetes, um, is it that DM actually causes myocardial infarction? Or is this that, you see, people who smoke tend to have DM. And of course, people who smoke tend to have myocardial infection also. Is it that because a large proportion of the people who are having DM are smokers, that's why we're seeing a relationship showing up between DM and myocardial infection. In that sense, the relationship between DM and MI being compounded by smoking. So, um, essentially, to, to answer the question about whether some, some, a third factor is a confounder or whether this relationship we are seeing is real, the question we ask is to go back to the definition of a confounder. Meaning that when we look at the data between diabetes, that we look at data and we estimate the relationship between diabetes and MI, and we figure out that yes, there's a relationship. The way to tell whether that's been driven by smoking is to ask the first question, is this associated with the exposure? So we look into our data, do we see a relationship between smoking and the end? Also, we also ask the question, is there a relationship between smoking and the outcome, which is myocardial infarction? If it is um, a confounder, we would see it being related to diabetes mellitus. We also see it being related to MI. The third question is a question we need to answer, not from, is a question we cannot answer from our data, but a question that we need to answer from a mechanistic theory. What do we know about how diabetes causes MI? Meaning that in the pathway from how diabetes causes MI, is smoking involved in between? If smoking is part of the mechanism through which diabetes causes MI, then we cannot categorize that as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, um, as a confounder. But we know that in this particular situation, you know, there are biological processes through which we think that <coughs> diabetes causes MI. So that's not essentially I mean, what we're thinking about. Oh. Oh. This might be a good point to take questions. Um, okay. If people have any questions, nobody has raised their hands. And that quiet can be concerning. It's either people fully understand or they're totally lost. So if anybody has questions, if it's unclear, if you want the lecturer to re, re to review this seg segment again because this is an a very important part of the class if you if you want this to be to if you want us to go over this again then and please but also maybe a poll will help also do okay all right we can take the poll So I'm seeing, so this poll, there are many ans correct answers here, but it looks like we haven't allowed you to specify multiple answers. 
So just choose any of the correct answers that you that you know to be correct, and 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 let's move on. Men in the poll now. Okay. I'm going to share one sec. Sorry. Share results. So, okay, I'm um, 28. So, is there, well, this is, this is great. Um, just by, by the nature of the fact that we're not, you're not able to make multiple choices, uh, it's a little bit hard to evaluate. But the first question I want to ask is, is there anybody who chose, is there anybody who wants to speak to option number two? Whether why it should be right or why it should be wrong. Option number two. If you raise your hand, I'll let you come up. Otherwise, I, I can just call. Okay, I think Lukman is raising his hand. So if you unmute yourself. Okay, so I think. Option two should be wrong, actually. Why do you say so? Because we are trying to get the relationship so between soil cadmium and cancer risk. So they must not be related. Thank you, Lukman. Um, do I see someone else raising up, their hand, raising up his hand also? Yes, so I... Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you pretty well. All right, so um, option two sh should be wrong um, because what we are checking for is confounding by socioeconomic status. However, option two is actually like, um, well, we are evaluating the relationship between soil cadmium and cancer risk. So um, soil cadmium must actually be related to cancer risk in its own sense, right? But because the question is asking for the requirement for confounding by socioeconomic status, um, that's, that B part is actually, is not, is not talking about socioeconomic status. So that's why it's actually a wrong option. But then that must actually be, um, the exposure must be related to the outcome as a like as a sentence is correct but as an option it's not correct thank you very much Lulu and and, and Lukman. you see so the, the first thing here is for you to figure out what do all this represent what's the exposure here what's the outcome here and what's the hypothesized um confounder here the exposure is called cadmium and the outcome is cancer so the putative relationship that we are testing is the relationship between soil cadmium and cancer risk. That has nothing to do with confounding. It can be related, it cannot be related, but that's what we're trying to find out in this study. Now, trying to know whether something else is a relationship and whether SES is a relationship rests on three things. And that's the definition of the confounder. It rests on knowing whether SES, for it to be a confounder, it has to be related to the exposure, so the outcome and not be the causal pathway. So that's what these options represent. Option A tells us SES has to be related to, to soil cadmium risk. That's 
as a confounder is the related to the exposure, which is one of the plants in the tri in the tripod definition of being a confounder. SES was related to cancer risk. Yes, that's the second plant in the tripod plant. SES must be the causal pathway between soil cadmium and cancer risk. That's the third requirement. So those are the three things you need to evaluate to know whether SES is in fact um, a confounder in this in this particular analysis. So we have a question in, in the comments and someone is asking whether we must always exclude confounders or should we just mention them as limitations of the study? That's a very interesting and important question. As a scientist and somebody who wants to come up with finding, findings that, because our findings, if you're looking for a causal finding that's going to go into policy, the ideal that you're trying to do is to separate out all the confounding effects. Because without serving out all the confounders, you cannot determine whether the relationship you're looking at is causal or not. And it's hard to create policy. But here's the reality. If we're not able to do the target trial, hardly ever are we able to completely remove all the confounders. So because most of the studies that we do, and in fact, all the studies that we do are never the ideal target trial, the ideal trial, what we end up doing is doing all the best we can at the level of design, at the level of analysis to remove as much confounding, to address as many confounders as possible. But most of the time we fall short of the ideal and there are still certain things that we have not been able to address. At that point, it behoves us to articulate and say, we've done this and this and this and this, which we think should address this and this and this and these confounders. But still, there are still some limitations of shortcomings that we've not been able to do. And therefore, there might still be some residual confounding as a result of this and this and this and this and this. And these are the implications of those confounders for the conclusions we can draw from this study. In essence, what I'm saying is that our aspiration is to remove all the confounders. We are almost never in a position to remove, you know, to adjust, to, ad to address all confounding. We do our best from design, from analysis, to remove all, to do, remove all the possible confounders we can, and then identify where problems might still exist and articulate that so that people can bear that in mind and not reach poor conclusions like the wise men we talked about earlier when they read our studies. I hope that addresses your concern. So, um, you know, I'm just going to, this is the most important thing for you here. So, so we have a follow-up question, sorry. Um, so one follow-up question is, so what's the difference between the confounder and an extraneous variable? So I think, I think that's likely an economics asking a question. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted, I mean, even though we've called this topic, I mean, this, this course an introduction to clinical and professional studies, the truth of the matter is that a lot of things we learn here extend to a whole lot of fields. Particularly, you see, when I talk about the, all, see, all the while I've been talking, sometimes I say in clinical medicine, in population health, and even in social sciences broadly, because these concepts extend into virtually all social sciences. There is the caveat though, when you, when you move into other social science fields, some, a lot of terminology changes a lot. So while epidemiologists talk a lot about confounders, um, people in economics talk about extraneous variables. And you know, a lot of a lot of other other terms that fundamentally, you know, you know, you see sometimes people are talking about covariates. You see a lot of people in psychology, even in, I mean, even in, even in economics, are, are talking about covariates. But fundamentally, what these things still represent 
are, I mean, this is still tied into the concept of confounders and how the relationship between one variable and the other variable, the manifest relationship might not necessarily represent a causal relationship. One, one more question. It says, how do I differentiate a predictor variable in a population study from a confounder? Oh. Essentially, you know, the problem with the term a predictor variable is that sometimes it is not a very precise term in the sense that it might mean a whole lot of different things to different people in different situations. But I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume, and if this is wrong, let me know over time. I'm going to assume that you're talking about in a regression framework, where we say something is a predictor variable. Well, sometimes people use that term to mean that we have been agnostic about any causal relationship, meaning that we are just saying that this variable A has a relationship with variable B. So um, maybe tribe or um, race is associated with risk of, I mean, risk of end-stage general disease. So we're not saying there's something about race that actually causes it. We're not saying there's something about intrinsic about it, but we know that if we know somebody, something's, somebody's race, we can tell whether this person is likely to end up with kidney disease or not. It might be because of social factors, it might be because of biological factors, but we are agnostic about causality. That's the sense in which some people use predictive variables in the context of regression, I mean, in the, I mean, of the regression framework. So in that sense, what they are saying is that well, the relationship between race and that might be confounded, might not be confounded. We are not really interested in looking at causality. Therefore, we are less concerned about that. But we know that race predicts um, end-stage general disease and predicts kidney outcome. In some other places, especially if you're moving out of epidemiology, if you're moving to some other fields, um, when people set up a regression framework and they include many, I mean, a, couple, a handful of variables as predictors, there's a primary predictor that, which is the primary exposure that they are interested in, which is the primary theory that they are interested in. And there are other covariates that are included in the model basically to separate, the effect, to separate out the effect of those covariates. Even though we are calling them covariates in that framework, they are essentially still, they are essentially confounders in the context of the conversation we're having right now. But because we haven't talked about regression here, and I mean, I don't want us to go down that line of conversation um, yeah. too much because it can be more confusing than elucidating. In, in the next few minutes, um, can I ask that we, we skip this slide and the next one and talk about how to address confounding well let me, let me see what we have okay that's the last one okay yeah okay that's so essentially um i would encourage us that confounding is an important topic um at the at the, at the heart of causal thinking is the ability to understand what confounding is and being able to remove i mean to address it there are other issues that we need to address in the context of causality, like selection bias, other kinds of biases. But I think the major one, the greatest challenge is confounding. And that's why there's been so many ways. People are, keep on coming with different kinds of ways that we can deal with, that we can address the problem of confounding. And there are two things. There are two stages in which we try to do with the problem of confounding. One is when you're designing your study, if you are worried that certain things might confound your study, you can bear that in mind and try to address it at the level of your study design. And the other one is when you're doing your analysis. One way, um, is, I mean, so in terms of study design, there are three main ways. Some very brilliant epidemiologists and statisticians have just figured out that, you see, if 
when if we are looking, if we want to test, for instance, whether prostamol reduces headache, and want to allocate some people to prostamol, some people to no prostamol. If you are afraid that there might be confounders, one way to ensure that there are no confounders is to ensure that all the variables that might be confounders, that might be confounders, maybe it's the age, it's the sex, is that they are equally distributed among those who are being allocated to prostamol and those who are not being allocated to prostamol. Because once the confounder is equally represented on both sides, it would not, we would say that we have what we call exchangeability, meaning that the confounder cannot influence the results, cannot influence the data we see in this particular study once it is evenly distributed. Because confounding basically occurs because it is unequally distributed among those who are exposed. So if you find a way to get it equally distributed and some brilliant epidemiologists and, 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 and um, statisticians have figured out that one way to do that is to find a random mechanism like tossing up a coin or rolling a dice or now we do that with the computer to ensure a random mechanism to, uh, to do the allocation. If you allocate randomly, if you rely on a random mechanism to allocate to the two arms of the study, that can help you ensure that confounders will be equally distributed on both arms of the study and we would have exchangeability and therefore you won't have problems with confounding. So randomization is um, one of the most reliable yeah, um, um, ways to address the problem of confounding and that is usually at the level of design where you have to allocate the um, subjects to different to the arms of the study. The other one is restriction. Say for instance, you are worried that, you know, um, maybe smoking is what is causing um, those who are taking coffee to appear as if they are having cancer. Maybe because when you compare people who are taking coffee to people who are not taking coffee, the reason why we see relationship between coffee and cancer is because most of the people who are in coffee are actually smokers. And because smoking causes cancer, that's why we are seeing a relationship between coffee smokers and cancer. One thing you can do is to say, you know what? So that smoking would not confound this study. Let's ensure that everybody who's in this study, whether you are, I mean, whether in the coffee arm or in the non-coffee arm, let's ensure that we ask everybody, have you ever smoked? Anybody who has smoked would not get into this study. That is restriction. We are restricting our study participation people who are non-smokers. Therefore, smoking cannot confound the study. Whereas randomization ensures that, you see, after we finish the study, people who are drinking coffee and people who are not drinking coffee in your study, you will find out that there will be equal number of smokers amongst them. That's what standardization helps you to achieve. But when we do restriction, have an issue. You ask everybody before they come. If you are smoking, you can't get to the study. Or you can say that everybody who gets to the study will be people who have smoked 10 years. So any effect you see, you know that it's not smoking because the coffee drinkers and the non-coffee drinkers are all you know, smokers. That is restriction. The third thing that you can do in matching though is to say, well, if we say that um, we want only smokers or only non-smokers, it will be hard for us to find enough people who are taking coffee to use in this study. So what we're going to do is this. Let's find anybody we can find that has that is taking coffee. If the person we find is a smoker, the control, the non-coffee person that we bring in the study will find someone who's a smoker too. If the next person, next person coffee drinker that we find to come into our study is a non-smoker, the control that we'll find must be a non-smoker too. So we have to keep on matching. We will match on smoking. So at the end of the day, when we finish, when we finish recruiting into our study, the coffee drinkers and the non-coffee drinkers will have equal number of smokers and not smokers because we have deliberately matched as at the time we're recruiting into our study. Now, this is just an introduction to these concepts. We will see them being used in many studies to try to address the issue of compounding to give room for causal interpretation. Now, sometimes we do not have the opportunity to be able to randomize, maybe because we're using secondary data or it was just not feasible. 
And we could not, those who conducted the initial study did not restrict, or we cannot restrict now. And we also don't have the opportunity to match. In that case, when we go into analysis, some brilliant statisticians have also come up with a way, some techniques, you know, the math is beyond what we want to discuss here, but they'll be able to show mathematically that there are some procedures that we can do that we call the regression model, where you can separate the effect of smoking and separate the effect of coffee on bladder, or on bladder cancer. And, you know, um, I'm not going to discuss how we do that here, but let's just know that what regression models kind of do is that they can separate out the effect of the different covariates that are included in the model. So in this situation, you will include coffee as a as a as a as a very as a um, you know as um as, as a variable in the in the in the model. You would include um um smoking too, and then you look at the effect of each of them on 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 bladder cancer. But the effect of coffee that you would see from this regression model would have set apart would be exclusive of the effect of smoking because smoking is also included in this model. And there are so many other um, techniques that are akin to regression models, um, but basically that tries to do the same thing, um, but we will not be going into those ones now. Um, there are also quasi experimental techniques, but I'm not gonna be talking about all of those that rely on certain assumptions and certain things that we do about the theory, the mechanistic theory between the exposure and outcomes that we are looking at. And uh, therefore, we can use certain approximations. They're not experiments, but certain approximations to experiments to still reach causal, um, to still gauge how much confidence we have about causal inferences that we're drawing from our study. At this point, we are past time. In essence, we'll be able to discuss the importance of personality um, in epidemiology studies. We'll be able to talk about some of the features of I mean, some of the definitions of what a cause means and the concept of, of causality as a probabilistic and uh, in, a, in a probabilistic and multifactorial model context. We've able to, also able to be able to talk about confounding as a concept and some of the ways in which we address confounding. I want to thank every one of you for your patience and your willingness to participate in this process. And I want to wish everyone of you good luck. And we'll become, I mean, thank you. Thank you very much for this session. This has been great. Um,